Take your Bible, if you will, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. We began this chapter last Wednesday. I do not intend to finish it tonight. Uh, we'll hopefully get up to verse 22. Uh, start at verse 11, get up to verse 22. But uh, don't intend to go the rest of the chapter tonight, primarily for the sake of time. And then to, of course, give the text fair treatment. Before we get into verses 11 to 22, I want you to look at verse 14, Hebrews 9, 14, because this is the essence of what we're going to talk about tonight. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14 says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Now I want you to think about that. We're going to talk about it. But right now let's pray again. Father, thank you for your word. We ask for your Holy Spirit to be our teacher and our guide this evening. Pray that you'll help us to learn more about what you have done for us and what you continue to do for us and what we can do for you. Lord, we just pray that you'll once again save every lost soul and strengthen the brethren that we might be better equipped in faith to serve you and to be testimonies to others. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we get into this text, I want to share with you uh, some words that the Lord Jesus taught. And these words will help us as a basis for interpreting what we're going to look at tonight. Uh, it's been said, and I don't know who first said it, but it's been said that the best commentary on Scripture is Scripture. And I'm going to add to that, the Bible all ties together. It, it all relates together. You cannot take part of the Bible and say, well, that has nothing to do with the rest of it. Uh, every bit of it, every page, every paragraph, every verse, every word is connected to all the rest of it. So I want to share with you this. This is the Lord Jesus speaking. And John 6 Verses 53 to 59, you don't have to turn to, you can if you want to, but I'm going to read it to you. Uh, this is a teaching that a lot of folks have had trouble with, uh, and actually since the time that the Lord spoke it, people have had trouble with it. So if you feel like you're having trouble with it, you're in good company because people have been uh, struggling to understand this for the last 2,000 years. It's really not hard to understand, but you have to take everything in context and that's what we're trying to do tonight so john 6 53 to 59 the lord gave this teaching he said quote then jesus said unto them verily verily i say unto you except ye eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood ye have no life in you whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life and i will raise him up at the last day for my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Then John adds these things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Now, if you had a bit of trouble with the Lord saying that and you, you don't quite get it, then what does he mean by eat his flesh and drink his blood? Well, Scripture is, again, the best commentary on Scripture. And listen to what he says. We just continue the passage that we read up through, I read to you up through verse 59. Listen to verses 60 to 62. It says, Many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? What do they mean by that? What is he saying? We don't get it. We don't understand it. Well, that sure doesn't make sense to us. That's verse 60. Verse 61. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? Is that offending you? Then he says, what and if, in verse 62, what and if you see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? Now, some of the people who were standing there that day, or perhaps they were sitting, and heard the Lord say this, 
would later be standing there and watching him return up to where he was before. You know that from Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. But in the very next verse, John 9, 63, the Lord explained this teaching. And that's what I mean. I say the best commentary on Scripture is Scripture. So verse uh, 63 of John 9 is where he said, It is the Spirit that quickeneth. Now, quickeneth there means makes alive. The Spirit makes alive. It doesn't mean makes you faster. It means makes you alive. It is the Spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. Don't miss that phrase. The flesh profiteth nothing. It's not about the flesh. What he's telling us here is the words that he spoke to us have a spiritual meaning, not limited to a physical meaning. Let me read verse 63 from the beginning then. He said, It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So he's telling us to take this in a spiritual sense, not merely a fleshly sense or a physical sense. He said it is the Holy Spirit that gives us life. The physical act of eating is not the lesson that he was teaching. The physical picture is the illustration of spiritual truth. He's talking about receiving him and receiving his sacrifice for us. Well, I'm, I'm not sure I quite see that yet, preacher. Well, we'll hang on. John 9, 64, 65, the Lord speaks of those who do not understand his teaching and some never will. What do you mean some never will? Well, verse 64, but he said, but there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. So the rejection of the Lord Jesus blinds the minds of those who hear his word. You and I are not ever fully going to understand the Bible apart from the Holy Spirit. Now you, you can understand parts of it, but you won't fully understand it apart from the Holy Spirit. We need his guide. And again, Jesus said these words are spirit, not flesh. And then verse 65, he said, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my father. Verse 66, he says that those who listen with physical ears are only going to hear physical things. But those who listen in the spirit will receive spiritual things. So from that time, it says, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. A lot of them had been following him. Now this is, remember, this is John 6. At the beginning of that chapter, and we didn't, read that but what goes on at the beginning of that chapter anybody remember beginning of John chapter 6 don't remember feeding of the 5,000 and he fed 5,000 people with a few loaves and two fish and boy after he fed them you know what they followed him how many 5,000 and many scholars believe and I think it's reasonable that the 5,000 counted the men in the crowd because that's usually what they did and there were probably women and children also so very likely it was much more than 5,000 people. But if it were only 5,000, that's a tremendous crowd. One night many years ago, we, I was up in the Chicago area and we were in a meeting in a, in a big city auditorium, if I remember right. And uh, church was hosting the meeting, but the meeting was not, that night was not held at the church. And uh, I looked around and uh, looked at the people there and, and one of the men who was with me a couple of men from the church had gone with us up there and sad to say i just flashed into my mind i'm i'm the only one left out of all those fellows made that trip the rest of them have all gone on to be with the lord but uh, we were sitting there and one of them said to me he says how many people you think are here tonight i said about five thousand and and the fellow said well how do you know that and i said i counted them and he said yeah right i said well i did I said, let me show you how. I said, see that section of seats right there? He said, yeah. I said, well, you count that. That's about 50 people. And you look over there. There's another section about the same size. So that's going to be 100. And you find another section. And you just count like that. And you can count a large crowd that way. It's not hard. Trust me, preachers are, are excellent at counting people. All right. So what I'm trying to get across to you is this. 
this huge crowd of 5,000 people follow him. But why are they following him? Because he fed them. And then he gets down to telling them that there's a true bread of life, not the bread that he had given them that day, but the true bread of life, and they need to partake of the true bread of life. And they don't get it. They don't get it. And it does not say this in the text, and, and I don't want to read into it something that just isn't there, but I wonder, and that's all it is, is me wondering, but I wonder if some of those people kind of just shrug their shoulders and say, well, I guess he's not going to feed us anymore, so we'll go home. Now, it, it does not say that. And so I, I'm not preaching that as truth. But what I am preaching as truth is this. We have to take the Lord for what he says, and what the Lord is teaching is that we have to receive the sacrifice of his body and the shedding of his blood on the cross as payment for our sin. John chapter 6 was not the only time that he spoke on this important subject. Oh, he talked about this other times? He did. And you, it's going to sound very familiar to you, I promise. But let me read to you four times that the Lord Jesus made reference to this same idea. Matthew 26, 28 he said, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for the remission of sins. What was he talking about? He was establishing the Lord's Supper in Matthew 26. Mark 14, 24, and he said unto them, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. What's he talking about? The bread and the cup of the Lord's Supper. Luke 22, 20. Likewise, also the cup after supper, saying this cup is the New Testament, my blood, which is shed for you. So the Lord Jesus taught that he shed his blood for our sins and that that blood is the blood of the New Testament. Something new, something better than before. And we've told you throughout this study in Hebrews that the key word in Hebrews is the word better. That which is better is, is that which follows something original. But the original in this case, and I'm going to emphasize this again and again as, as we continue through Hebrews, the original was just figurative, but it spoke of that which is real. So Paul added to the picture in 1 Corinthians 11, 25, when he quoted the Lord saying, this is the fourth time of the Lord's word, after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament, my blood. This do as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. And Paul mentions the New Testament again when he says in 2 Corinthians 3, 6, Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, meaning the law, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth so what Paul is saying is the same thing Jesus is saying in John 6. He's saying that this is a spiritual truth, not just a physical truth, not just a material truth. It is a spiritual truth. It is illustrated, it is pictured in physical things. But that's not the reality. Now that goes kind of in contradiction to what we usually think. We usually think that which you can taste, touch, see, smell and hear that that's real and by the way it is and those things which you cannot see taste touch smell uh, or hear those things are the things that aren't real but again it's the opposite here that bread is not the real body of christ that cup is not the real blood of christ what is the bread well i'm going to tell you different people use different things in our church we use matzah and that's the bread. Why do you use matzo? Well, often we buy matzo that is made in Jerusalem. Isn't that good? And uh, why do you do that? It, it, it has no more power. It doesn't. It's still just that matzo made in New York or Miami has as much power as matzo made in Jerusalem. It's not, it's not about that. But the truth of the matter is that's probably close to what they served. Although I have to tell you, when I was in Israel 30 years ago and we had one night a Lord's Supper, the bread that they passed around was, in, and I don't know if this how it was originally, but it was like a tortilla. It was flat and soft like a tortilla. 
Now, is that what they used at the Last Supper? Folks, I wasn't there. I don't know. One thing we do know is it wasn't leavened bread. And the matzah is not leavened bread. Because it was the Passover meal and they would not have eaten leavened bread. So it would not be bread that had risen. It would have been a flat bread of some sort. Now, <clears throat> all that said, by introduction, now let's take a look at verse 11. Hebrews 9 and verse 11. It says, but Christ being come and high priest of good things to come. Now that's important. Christ is our high priest. We've said that before in this study, and we've looked at this thought before. But he is our, our high priest. The writer of Hebrews here is continuing this theme that the Lord gave to Israel, as he does to us, physical activities and objects teach us and prepare us for spiritual reality. So Christ, our high priest, one of high priest is one who goes to God on your behalf. You are not holy. You cannot approach God. So the priest goes to God for you. And the high priest goes to God. And, and in the law of the Old Testament, it was only the high priest who could actually enter into where the dwelling place of God's presence was or in the Holy of Holies. So the high priest of good things to come. The reality had been pictured for thousands of years, but here it's not a picture anymore. The picture has been fulfilled. Do you ever see somebody in a picture and then meet them in person? Has that ever happened to you? It's happened to me. And not long ago, we were in a, uh, down here at First Baptist Church of Hillsboro and for the grand opening of their new building. It was, it was a wonderful, wonderful, beautiful new building they have. And it was a wonderful evening, wonderful services that evening. And uh, lots of people came in, lots of preachers came there from different places. And I saw a man walk in, and I'd never seen him in person before, but as soon as I saw him walk in, I knew instantly who he was. And I told him that. And he said, well, how did you know? I said, I've seen your picture a hundred times. Never had seen him before, but I'd seen his picture. Well, how come you saw his picture? Well, he's a pretty well-known preacher, and his picture gets him many publications. So I'd seen his picture a hundred times at least. And so when I saw him in person, I, I knew immediately who he was. And then we, we had a good conversation. So that's, I tell you that to tell you that when we, or when they went through the sacrifices of the temple, they were looking at the picture. But now the person has come. And if you understand that which is pictured, you're going to know the person when you see them. Now, it mentions here in verse 11, Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. We talked about this a few times recently, about the old tabernacle and how the, its uh, last location had been discovered and so forth. But this is not that tabernacle. This is a greater, more perfect tabernacle. Again, the reality as opposed to the picture. And it says not made with hands, which means not the work of men and not of this building, not the type of work that men could do if they chose to. Verse 12, neither by the blood of bulls, I'm sorry, excuse me, doesn't say that, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Let's talk about that for a minute. Why is the blood sacrifice necessary? Do you remember the first sin? Somebody raise your hand if you remember what the first I don't mean your first sin. What was the first sin? Okay, and, and what did they do? Okay, they disobeyed God. And what did God tell them would happen if they disobeyed him? They've died. The day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So from the beginning, it's understood that sin leads to death. Death is the penalty for sin. Mankind knew that from the very beginning. The first people on the planet knew that. And did they pass it on to their sons? They did. It's, it's clear in Scripture. It's not stated just the way I, I just stated it, but it's clear in Scripture. 
So why was the blood necessary? Listen to Leviticus 17.11. This is part of the law. Leviticus 17.11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. What were they going to lose when they sent their life? The life of the flesh is in the blood. That's so true. For sake of time, I won't go into it. But that is such a true statement. The life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. Now, why is that? Because the blood gives life to the flesh. No blood, no life. Let me go a step farther with that. Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. Paul was speaking to the elders of the Ephesian church for the last time that he would ever see them face to face. And here's what he said to them. He said, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, overseers, bishops, pastors. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost, who made them overseers, the Holy Ghost, hath made you overseers to feed the church of God. Now listen to this rest of this verse, so important. Which he, the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Let me run that by you again. The church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. The church of God was purchased with whose blood? Now listen to the verse. Thank you. To feed the church of God, which he, he is a pronoun. A pronoun needs an antecedent. That means there's a noun that is represented by the pronoun. What is the noun in that verse represented by the pronoun he? It's God. To feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. He's saying that the blood which was shed on the cross was the blood of God. That's exactly what he's saying. Verse 13. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctify to the purifying of the flesh colon there not a period not the end of the thought but what he's saying here in verse 13 is the blood of animals sanctifies the flesh what does sanctify mean it means to clean cleanse and set apart for God's service so it sanctifies the flesh which means it is the vis visible physical element the ceremonial and ritual element of the, this great spiritual truth of sanctification, cleansing and being set apart for God's service. So again, verse 13, for if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a helter, heifer, excuse me, sprinkling the unclean sanctify to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ now think about that comparison. The blood of animals, the blood of bulls and goats. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, the Holy Spirit, offered himself without spot to God. I don't know if you caught this. Maybe you did. I'm hoping you did. But let me go through that again with you. Verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. Do you not see the Trinity there? Christ, the eternal spirit, God. Don't let anybody tell you the Trinity is not in the Bible. And there are folks who will try to tell you that. Don't listen to them. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Now, that's the verse we started with tonight. So how much more in a greater sense, in a better sense, in a real sense, shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, the Holy Spirit offered himself, who knew no sin, was without spot to God the Father, how much more shall his offering purge your conscience from dead works like the offering of Cain to enable you to serve the living God? You cannot really serve God until you're saved. 
I was a senior in high school and we went through, uh, I was taking English literature and we went through uh, English literature it was the subject of class and we went through one unit and they called it the Bible as literature. And in that uh, we looked more at poetry about the Bible than we did the Bible itself. But uh, looked at the uh, one English poet, classical English poet who said uh, he looked for ways to serve God, could not find a way to serve God, but his conclusion was they also serve who only stand and wait. So what he was saying is that if you don't know how to serve God, wait, stand and wait till God shows you. They're not a bad thought. I'm not criticizing that. What I'm saying to you, though, is it's not possible to serve God until you have been born again. Why not? Because A, you don't have the leadership of the Holy Spirit. B, you don't know what God's will for your life is. And C, you don't have the capability of serving God until you've been born again. So this is what it's saying, to serve the living God. It enables you to serve the living God. Verse 15, and for this cause, what cause? That you might be purged from dead works, purge your conscience from dead works, serve the living God. For this cause, he is the mediator. Who is the mediator? Christ is the mediator. Now, what is a mediator? Mediator is someone who goes between two parties that are in opposition to each other and seeks reconciliation. That's what a mediator is or who a mediator is. Now, let me share this with you. How are we in opposition to God? Well, read Romans 5 and it'll explain it to you, but let me just put it simply. We have sinned against the holy God and our sin puts us in opposition to him. Because we have, in essence, said, as Adam and Eve said, well, I heard what you said, God, but I'm not going to do what you said. I'm going to do what I want to do. And that puts us in opposition to God. For this cause, he is the mediator. He is the one who goes between the two parties in opposition to each other because we've sinned. And look at verse 15 again. For this cause, he is the mediator of what? What does it say? He's the mediator of what? Verse 15. The New Testament. We need a mediator to enter into the New Testament. We do. We do. We can't enter into the New Testament by ourselves. Wait, wait, preacher, what are you saying? I can't open Matthew and start reading by myself. No, it's not what I'm saying. It's not what the text is saying. It's saying we can't enter into this New Testament, which is a new covenant, something new that God has set up. It's a new relationship, and it requires us to be reconciled to God. And in order for us to be reconciled to God, the penalty for our sin has to be paid, and that is death. And so the blood, the life of the flesh, must be shed. So he is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death, for the redemption, that's what we just said, by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament. How are the transgressions under the first testament? Because the first testament is the testament of the law, and the law is our accuser and our prosecutor. It tells us what is right and what is wrong, what is sin, and it tells us when we break it that what the penalty is. So the law is our prosecutor our accuser and our prosecutor. We have been indicted, we have been arraigned, and we have come to trial, and the law is witness against us. That's what it's saying. Let's start verse 15 again. For this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, the law, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Now, what does that mean? You might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. There's a lot of coincidence, for lack of a better term, between the book of Galatians and the book of Hebrews. I think it's a good chance they were both written by the same author, but even if they weren't, I have one uh, Bible that has a, a note that's not the Bible I'm using tonight, but has a note that says, that they, they 
commentator there thinks that Timothy wrote Hebrews. Well, I think that's possible. I don't know as I can present that to you as a, a hard truth, but it's possible. Well, why do you think that's possible? Well, Timothy was a great student of Paul, and Hebrews is written much in the style that Paul would have written and much from the pu viewpoint that Paul would have had. So as Timothy was a great student of Paul, he might have written it. That's all you got? Yep, that's it. That's all I got. Can't give you any more than that. So it's pure speculation is what I'm telling you. But I told you that to read this to you. Galatians 4, verses 5 to 7. Jesus came, quote, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts. By the way, there's the Trinity again. Crying, Abba, Father. A term of endearment, like saying, Daddy. Where... For thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, don't miss this, then an heir of God through Christ. If you're no longer a servant, if you're now adopted in the family and you're a son, you're now a child of God, then you are an heir of God through Christ. Now with that in mind, let's read verse 15 again. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Verse 15 is pretty much saying the same thing Galatians 4, 5 through 7 saying. Go to verse 16. For where a testament is, a lot of times people suggest to you and there's no law that says you have to do this i will tell you that under the law it's better if you do it but the law doesn't say you have to do it but a lot of people suggest to you that you write out a will a written will so that when you pass away uh, it answers all kinds of questions about what your last will was and if you have possessions to whom you'd like them to go or if you own anything uh, how you'd like it to be distributed and and, and other things as well a lot of times it involves what you want done with your remains and, and, and other items. Now, again, at least in Florida, the law does not say you have to have a will, but if you pass away without a will, it makes any potential heirs that you have have a much more difficult time carrying out what your will was. Said that to say this, verse 17, for a testament is a force, goes into effect, after men are dead. That last will and testament, it's often called, doesn't go into effect until you die. So it says, for this cause, he's, I'm sorry, verse 16, for where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator for it to go into effect. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Whereupon, neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. The Old Testament, that covenant was not dedicated without blood. Required the blood of sacrificed animals. 19, for when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats and with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, and he did, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with the blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. Here's why. And this is the conclusion of this whole passage. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood without shedding of blood there is no remission what's remission remission is payment payment for what for our sins without shedding of blood there is no remissions no remission i i recommend to you again not requiring it of you but i recommend you memorize verse 22 it'll help you 
It'll help you in understanding your Bible. Almost all things are by the law purged with blood. Without shedding of blood, there is no remission. So because your sins, uh, sons, sorry, because your sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, wherefore thou art no more a servant but a son, and if a son, then an heir through Christ. So the Old Testament is confirmed in the blood of animals, but that was figurative and prophetic. The New Testament is what the Old Testament was all about, and it is confirmed and sealed by the blood of Christ. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Father, thank you so much for the time we've had together here tonight. Bless us as we go our separate ways. Help us, Lord, to keep our focus upon you. Help us to rejoice in that which was done for us. Christ died for us that we might not need to die to pay for our own sins. He lives today and he gives us eternal life. Help us to go out rejoicing and sharing the good news with others. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.